Okay. They're not recording yet, but I'll talk. I'll do some stuff. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how we haven't been banned either. Trust me. Because <laughs> every now and then I wake up and there's some news source about some bishop that did something and I'm like, oh, I'm like going nuts. <laughs> and it's so hard because I'll, I'll type stuff up for social media and then I'm like, delete. I'm like, that's going to get me in trouble. And I'm like, then I rewrite it and I'm like, that's worse. <laughs> I'm like, oh. So yeah, keep us in your prayers. Um, our Lady and St. Joseph protect us for sure. I mean, they, they wrap us under their mantle and under their cloak. Because um, things are crazy right now, as you know, in the world and in the church and, and everywhere. So um, we need your prayers big time. For me, it's such a comfort to have Father Chris, whom everybody knows now, right? He's like so amazing. He's my superior. He's my provincial. That's amazing to me. I'm just like, wow. And I brought that guy into the community. <laughs> it's so funny. That's okay. He's, he's my commanding officer now, and I salute him. So that's perfectly fine. Okay, so he said a prayer, which is great. We're off to a good start. And so my talk um, is on St. Joseph in the Eucharist. St. Joseph as the protector of the Eucharist. Um, it's an interesting title, right? Because we don't often make the connection between St. Joseph and the Eucharist. Because if you, you know, in the New Testament, it's like, yeah, Father Callaway, you're really gonna have to stretch that one, buddy, because he died at some point before Jesus even began his public ministry. So St. Joseph was not present when Jesus was going around for three years with his disciples in the Holy Land, preaching, teaching, healing, all of that. And he, he wasn't present at Holy Thursday, St. Joseph. He wasn't present at Good Friday, Holy Saturday, the resurrection, none of that. So how am I gonna work this one? How am I going to squeeze St. Joseph into this? Well, it's actually quite easy. Because if you think about it, without St. Joseph, we would not have the Eucharist. That's how essential he is to this. Because for 2,000 years now, we've known this essential truth about Our Lady, for sure. And Our Lady is much greater than St. Joseph, of course. He'd be the first one to tell us that, right? Pay attention to my wife. That's what St. Joseph would say, not me. I'm, I'm just here to do the chores and do the work. You know, I'm, I'm going to get them to the hill so they can save the world. Um, so... But without him, he wasn't physically required for the incarnation. St. Joseph is not the biological father of Jesus, but he is his true father, just like I'm adopted, right? And, and I call my dad, I don't call my dad Don, you know. I'm sure that Jesus didn't, you know, say Joseph, you know. No, he would have called him Abba, Daddy, Father. He was his real father. Um, and his role was, was really required, was necessary. Our Lady was necessary physically. She gave the material, the flesh, to God when he became incarnate. St. Joseph did not cooperate in that. But his authority, his paternity, his love were required. And who is Jesus? He's, he's the bread from heaven who has come to feed the nations. And, you know, I'll start off by saying this, and then we'll do a little historical kind of trail here, a uh, 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 passage to a greater appreciation of St. Joseph. You know, what happened, well, I'll start off with this. Do you remember in the Old Testament, you might not remember the books or the verses or anything, I don't either, to be honest with you, but <laughs> in the book of Genesis, that's about as specific as I can get, I don't know the specific verses, do you remember about a guy named Joseph? Do you remember him? Not our Joseph, right? A lot of, it's so funny, people are like, Father, St. Joseph wasn't back then. I'm like, well, duh, I'm not talking about St. Joseph, right? <laughs> Like, where'd you go to catechesis? You know, no, this was thousands and thousands of years ago. There was another dude named Joseph who had a whole bunch of brothers and... <laughs> Wait, did I say something weird? Yeah. No, I, I gotta check myself. Sometimes I do a Freudian slip. I gotta make sure I'm not saying something stupid. Okay, so another Joseph had a whole bunch of brothers and they were jealous of him. Right, you know what I'm talking about. So the father made a coat of many colors, they say, and so... They were super jealous, and they were like, we want that jacket. I mean, how weird, you know? <laughs> Just make another one, dude. <laughs> you know, it's like, not a big deal. Anyway, so they were going to kill him. They were going to kill their brother. And then one of the brothers, was it Benjamin or one of them? I have to look at it again. It might have been, right? So he says, hold on, let's not kill him. He's our flesh and blood. So they, he said, let's throw him here in this hole in a cistern, right? <laughs> okay, I guess that's better, <laughs> you know? So they, they threw him in a hole. And then they thought, well, wait, this could be lucrative. Let's sell them, you know. And so they sold their brother to a, to a caravan of people going down to Egypt. 
so Joseph goes there, and then Pharaoh puts him, like, in his kind of, I don't know, as a servant, and he interprets his dreams. Joseph does. That's interesting. And then um, Pharaoh is so impressed with this Joseph that he puts him in charge of all of his grain, right? So at that time, Egypt was the breadbasket of the world. It storehoused all this grain, and when people needed food, bread, they would go to Egypt. Well, what happened? A famine happened. And then everybody's coming to Egypt at the known world at that time looking for bread. And even Joseph's brothers sold him into slavery. And they come, and they don't recognize him. A lot of time had gone by. And they see him. He knows who they are, but they don't recognize him. So he toys around with them a little bit. And he doesn't reveal his identity. And he does something very interesting. He gives them some, some grain to make bread to go back to their father, who is also his father, but what does he put in their bags? A chalice. What's up with that? That's kind of random. Why would you do that? Maybe he wasn't even aware of what he was doing, but there were things that were going to be prototypes that would, that would be fulfilled later in a much greater way by a much greater Joseph with a much greater bread who would have a chalice and a bread to feed the nations. Amazing stuff. So, Pharaoh himself, a pagan ruler, because all these people are coming, says to the people, I think this is Genesis chapter 44, he says, Ite ad Yosef, to the people, which means go to Joseph, because he's the keeper of the bread. Okay, all of that happened, historically, like a long time ago. Right. So, what about our times? It's very interesting. Hmm, let's... let's I've been thinking about this a lot lately. And again, i got to be careful so I don't get canceled here. So <laughs> um, remember what happened just like a few years ago? What happened? All the storehouses containing the bread were closed. What am I referring to? Churches, right? Don't even get me started, right? Mm, 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 mm. That's a whole other episode, right? That's a different talk. Okay. At any rate, they were closed. Fascinating. Because what did God do at that same time? Established a year of St. Joseph. A new Joseph, the greater Joseph, was going to come on the scene at the time when there was a famine and open them up again. Right? Regardless of those who closed them, open them up again. It happened. So in Mar was it March 2020? So, yeah, when it all went down, right, and everybody's freaking out and putting a diaper on their face, and, you know, it was crazy, crazy, right? Crazy, you know? It was nuts, everything that was going on. So, that happened, everything shut down. You couldn't go to church. You couldn't receive the bread of angels. You were locked out. Then what did God do through his church? Open, yeah, declared a year of St. Joseph. Joseph would come on the scene in a way unparalleled in the history of Christianity. And the doors would begin to open again so that the nations could be fed again with the bread of life. You know, and it didn't even really... Let's back up even 100 years ago. Do you know that it was only like 100 years ago that Catholics began to be privileged, the laity, to be able to receive Holy Communion on a daily basis through the papacy of Pope St. Pius X? Prior to that, the saints, did, they didn't receive, the, if they were laity, uh, the Eucharist on a daily basis. No. We often think that they did. Like, we're, we're so used to it today that we think it's normal. It wasn't normal. They only went on Sundays. So why did that happen 100 years ago? Because St. Joseph was doing incredible things. It was at the same time that there was a new movement of devotion and focusing on St. Joseph that St. Joseph was declared the patron of the church, the father of the church, and the Catholic Church opened it up for everybody to be able to receive communion on a daily basis. They were parallel events that were happening at the same time. And yet, we haven't really made fully these connections. We haven't unpacked everything that's been going on with relation to St. Joseph. There's incredible things that are going on right now with St. Joseph. We're living in such a privileged time with this great saint, the man behind the scenes who has never gotten proper credit. You know, if you look at, you know, even the Christmas cards that you buy, your Hallmark cards or your, your images of St. Joseph, how has he been portrayed? 
good answer. Wow, you guys know your stuff. Yeah. <laughs> old. And there's nothing wrong with old men. Trust me. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. I've given these talks and people come up to me like, Father, you hate old men? I'm like, what? <laughs> of all the things I said, that's what you... In, how, come on. No, of course not. But that's how he's been portrayed. And because we didn't know a lot about St. Joseph. We didn't really understand because the New Testament, we don't have one word from him. And we only have certain scenes. We don't have too much on his life. And so people tried to fill in the gaps with noble intentions. But a lot of it was guesswork. A lot of it was they were just making up theories. And it's understandable on some level. So, for example, even when I became a Catholic through my seminary studies, I just assumed that he was old, too, because that's what I would hear most times from the pulpit. I would also hear that he was previously married. You ever hear that? Right, that he was a widower, had other children, and I was like, well, that's what Father says, so who am I as a you know, little seminarian to think differently? This guy's been educated and such, and so I don't know. It seems odd to me that God would give to Our Lady secondhand goods, but whatever, you know, it's not... Uh, sorry, but you know what I'm saying, okay? Again, if that's your situation, you're like, hey, right? I get it. But you know what I mean, okay. So... It never really clicked. I'm like, I don't get it. I mean, if you're going to give a man to be Our Lady's husband and to raise the Messiah, I mean, okay, maybe he doesn't have to be Brambo or Bruce Lee, although I think that'd be sweet, but <laughs> wouldn't he have to be, like, manly and, 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 like, have memory and not have to take afternoon naps all the time? And how is he going <laughs> to walk to Egypt with them and, and, and all the things that are required? That didn't really rub with me right, but I didn't know the stuff. So, anyway... So about six years ago, when um, I got this inspiration, I believe from the Holy Spirit, to do something with St. Joseph, because the times that we live in right now, what is it? 69% of people no longer believe in the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. That just not, that's not me just saying that because i got a microphone and you're forced to listen to me. That's a, that's a survey that's it's been shown four years ago, I think it was. Um, and what was the other one I just read the other day? Literally, it might have been yesterday or the day before. 75% of Catholics approve of so-called gay marriage. 75%, right? So we're, we're in a bad way, folks. We're in a real bad way. And so we've got a real crisis right now on what I would talk, say would be anthropological issues of there's confusion, right? What is a woman? That's the, you know, today. And... It's crazy. I mean, you've got, you've got dudes who think that they can have a monthly cycle now and can have a baby. I mean, that's insanity, okay? I mean, you're mentally, you need some help. You need some serious inpatient care if you're thinking that way. But the vast majority of the education system, of the higher education, of all the universities and all that, that's what they buy into. Everything's gone woke, right? And we know what happens with everything that goes woke. Well, I won't say it, but you know where I'm going with that, right? Yeah, it does. It truly turns to, mm, it does. Because this is how bad we are right now. So how do we get out of this? That's what I, my question was. When people are coming to me as a priest, how do I get them to believe in the Eucharist again? How do, do I help them to turn away from these unnatural understandings of sexuality and all this wokeness and all this craziness? How do I get them back? I, I mean, what do I do? I celebrate Mass. I hear confessions, and that's the greatest thing that I can do. But people need homework at home. These are home issues, Right. If you look at the amount of children now today who are raised without a father, a father figure is massive. It is so big. That was my experience. I had three dads before I was 10 and none of them were St. Joseph. I mean, <laughs> you know, this has become the norm today, unfortunately. So that's when it came to me. We need a model of manhood, of real manhood, because a lot of the problems that we've had today are because it's been the men who are the ones who did not take their wife and children to church to receive the bread. And when it's the father who doesn't do that, again, studies have shown that if those children grow up in a household where the father is not the one leading the family in the practice of the faith, that it's like 75% of those children will no longer practice the faith when they leave from un under that roof. Why? Because dad didn't do it. If it's only left up to the mother to do it, which sometimes happens by default, of course, and women are much better at it than men, but... That's not the point. Men's role is essential. It has to be there. If it doesn't, there is going to be drastic things that take place. So, for example, think about this. In the life of the Holy Family, 
You've got Jesus, who's God, Mary, who's not God, but a perfect creature, the Immaculata, and then you've got Joseph, right? Poor guy. <laughs> so when the family practiced their faith, when they went to the temple, when they did various Jewish rituals and so forth and ceremonies, and they went down to Jerusalem, who was it that led it? Was it Jesus? No. And he's God. He didn't lead it. He didn't lead the prayers in the family. That wasn't his role, even though he's God. He'd do it way better than Our Lady and St. Joseph. Nope. He didn't take usurp their role. Was it Mary's role? No. She could have done it way better than St. She could have said to St. Joseph, honey, that was nice, but I'll, I'll, I got it. No. no. And she would have been right. Okay. But she didn't. She let him be the man, the head of the household. See, today everybody's triggered. Everybody's triggered by everything today. How dare you? Men are not the head of my house. Well, then you're going to have a jacked up house. Seriously. It's not, we're not saying that, that men are better than women, because we're not. Everybody knows that men are not better than women. The, right. Yeah. Okay. You're laughing at weird times, so I don't know if I'm saying something wrong here. So, I mean, the majority of the people at the foot of the cross were not men. They were women. Right. I mean, it's an incredible thing that the greatest human person who ever lived was not a man. Jesus is a divine person. He's got a divine and human nature, but his personhood is divine. In other words, he's not a schizophrenic. He doesn't have a divine person, a human person. I'm God. No, I'm not. Yes, I am. He's not a weirdo. He's, he's God. He's a divine person. He's not a human person. So the greatest human person who ever lived was not a man, but a woman, Our Lady. And yet she knew her role, and she didn't take it away from her husband. Because that happens a lot today. You know, women, God bless them, just want to kind of do everything because their husband sucks at it. <laughs> and so they just end up doing it. Okay, but let him do it, all right? He'll get better. You can refine his manhood because it takes a woman to refine the manhood of a man and make him better. It's how it works. But today we've got all these, this confusion about these issues. So that's when I really believe that in this time of crisis, in belief in the Eucharist, and belief in what marriage is, and, and, and what bathroom you should use, <laughs> you know, and all these other crazy things. We need a man to come in and to establish order. It takes a husband and a father to establish order in the household when it's a mess, when there's chaos. And that's what St. Joseph does for the house, God's family, that's been put under his care. It's what a good father does. And so, it's, it's very apparent to me that we have this happening today with St. Joseph coming in and restoring order and bringing back people to Jesus Christ into belief in his real presence, bringing them back to the sacraments. So where did this all begin specifically? Because we've always loved St. Joseph from the beginning of the church, of course, even though there were misunderstandings of him, he's old, he was formerly married, which by the way is not the teaching of the church. You show me the catechism, the apostolic letter, the encyclical, the document, the council statement that says these things. You can't. You, you will not find it because it's not true. They're, those are based on apocryphal literature, non-inspired, non-approved, and interesting for sure. We get some interesting stuff from those. But it's not the teaching of the Catholic Church that he was an old man. Actually, there is some brilliant stuff coming out right now by a theologian, Dr. Brant Petrie. Wow. I wish I had found that dude's videos before I published my book because, you know, people were saying, well, Father, that's good. You, you're saying that saints have said this and mystics and an apparition shows him as younger and so forth. That's nice, but it's too bad you can't ground it in divine revelation, Father, this age of Joseph thing. Instead, it, otherwise, it just seems like it's your opinion or the saints, and saints aren't right on everything all the time when it comes to these matters. So I was like, yeah, it's true. I wish I could. Well, Dr. Brant Petrie actually has because he's smart, right? Like knows like a ton of languages. And, and so he's unpacked the Greek in the New Testament of what words are used to when it's describing St. Joseph and his manhood. And according to first century um, Christianity, second century, there's documents that show age brackets for when certain words are used in Greek in the New Testament talking about manhood. And the age bracket for the ones that are used for Joseph put him between, I think it's age 28 and 45. It's like, wow. So this is, it's in divine revelation, actually. We missed it for 2,000 years. That's amazing. So it's just tremendous stuff. And then that whole, the whole widow thing, uh, you know, it's, 
That's not the teaching of the church. Never has been. Actually, there's a very firm tradition that St. Joseph was a virgin, just like Our Lady. Doesn't that make sense? It totally does, right? Totally does. So, but, you know, as we went through church history, there weren't the crises that we were, were having today. So people didn't really look to St. Joseph to do battle for them over things like marriage. Even heretics in the 13th century knew that marriage is between a dude and a woman, right? Even the bad guys back then who, who had problems didn't deny what marriage was. Or, you know, even um, people who struggle with other aspects of the teaching of the church, they didn't linger too far away. They would still hold to some essentials, but that's not the case today. We're living in a post-human era today, a post-Christian era today, where even today, you know, our, our calendars are changed. Have you seen this lately? It's amazing. Like, now th they start it, like, on a Saturday. Like, I get so confused, I'm trying to plan out my life, and I, I'm like, wait, there's two S's at the beginning. What? What's up with that? I'm like, oh, they're doing Saturday first. Why? Because they don't want the day of the Lord to be the first day of the week anymore, right? Or that whole A.D. thing, Anno Domini, they got rid of that. Look, look at most of your children's textbooks now. It's not A.D. anymore. What? It's C.E., Right. It's the common era is what they're referring to. I call it the common error, right? It's not, what are you doing here? They're kicking Jesus out of history. They don't want it to be centered on him. So we're, we're moving past Christianity now um, in the culture, and it's scary. And so at this time, God is saying to us, you know what? I've saved the big guns for this time. For the time of crises when people don't even know what they are. I mean, you can identify today as a cat and have rights. And, and if your teacher doesn't purr back to you, you can, you can sue the teacher. This is insane what we're living through right now. So we need a father to come and to restore order and help us, but in a loving way, in, in, a, in a compassionate way, realizing that his children are sick and they need care. They need, he needs to smother them with kisses and tons of mercy. This is why we're here this weekend. But... Truth as well. We have to say the truth. And there's going to be no better person to do this than St. Joseph, who is so loving, who is so kind, who is so gentle, filled with so much tenderness, compassion, and all of that. You betcha. And yet, he's what? The pillar of families, the guardian of virgins, the glory of domestic life, the terror of demons, his titles and his litany. You know, it's fascinating that we can actually pinpoint a time in history when the Holy Spirit was going to give St. Joseph to the church in the world in anticipation of what was coming. So from the beginning of the church, people loved St. Joseph, but they didn't talk about him too much. They didn't write on him. They didn't do too much. There were saints who were devoted to him, but it was more devotional, St. Teresa of Avila and a whole bunch of others. Good stuff, real good stuff. But there wasn't a theology of St. Joseph like there was on Our Lady or the Saints or the Cross or Soteriology, Ecclesiology, and all these other ologies. There wasn't that kind of stuff. There wasn't a Josephology. And all of a sudden, something changed. And the year was 1870. Something radical was going on in the world. Now, I'm going to say this. I don't, hopefully, there's not too many young children here. I hope there's no young children here, actually. But um, are there any? Okay. Oh, good. Okay. All right, here we go. Yeah, here we go. All right. So in the mid to late 19th century, do you know what was being manufactured? Synthetic rubber. Condoms would begin to come on the scene, right? That's why the Pope declared, one of the reasons why the Pope declared the Immaculate Conception in 1854, because life was going to be, start being attacked like it had never been attacked before, Right? Isn't that interesting, too? God could have had the church declare that dogma of the Immaculate Conception back in the 13th century, 7th century, or right at the very beginning. But he didn't. Why? Because there was going to be a battle in the future over life. And God would save this great gift of the Immaculate Conception to be declared a dogma until 1854 because of this. And then right after that, what was going to happen? In 1870, you had St. Joseph declare the patron of the church the father of the church. The timing, the battle, something was going, coming. And God, it was being set up. The devil had a battle plan, setting it up. And God was saying, yeah, not going to happen. We're going to bring in the big guns. And so in 1870, when that was declared, the Pope declared St. Joseph the patron of the church. What was heaven's response to that? St. Joseph came. 
in an apparition. Do you know where? Knock. Knock, Ireland. Don't even get me started on the other Joe that's going there, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm. Not on my watch. Not on my watch. Nope. See, we got a parallel battle going on. The devil is the ape of God. He can't create. He can't. He can't. So what does he do? Like a monkey in a zoo, he, he imitates, mimics, and mocks what he sees being done on the other side. That's what the devil does. So God's got his Joe, and the devil's got his too. Seriously. I mean, you, you, you couldn't get any clearer on these things. I mean, think about it. The year of St. Joseph happened in what? 2020, right? Right. St. Joseph got one year. What'd the other one get? Four. Right. There's a battle going on, my friends. Do you not see it? Right? Our Joseph wants to open the churches. What'd the other one do? Close them. Right. I've got a whole list, a litany, side by side, which I would definitely get canceled for and have to go underground if I shared it with you. But <laughs> it's true. There is something so clear for those who see it, who pray, and who, who, who can recognize what's going on. So, St. Joseph comes in an apparition in Knock, Ireland, 1879, right after he was declared the patron of the church on a rainy day, Ireland, and appears to a whole bunch of people with Our Lady. She's there. St. Jo John the Apostle is there, and a lamb, like depicting our Lord as the Lamb of God. They didn't say anything. Classic St. Joseph. I'm like, I, if, I, if I'd been one of those Irish people, I would have been like, say something. <laughs> Speak, right? Finally, he's on the scene. Talk, right? But he didn't. And neither did Our Lady. Nobody said anything. They didn't need to. They, their presence was a comfort to the people because they were going through a famine. So after that, fully approved apparition, um, amazing things started to happen with St. Joseph because the battle was going to start raging big time with modernism and Freemasonry and all these things happening globally that were going to be, start attacking the church. And so we get the first official encyclical on St. Joseph by Pope Leo XIII in 1889. You know, it's almost, it's almost embarrassing for me to say this as a priest. It took the church 1,889 years to get a document on St. Joseph. That's how just, he wasn't, nobody talked about him. But we got it, and it's awesome. That those encyclicals of old, those things rock, right? So clear, no ambiguity, super clear about what he's talking about. And he says that devotion to St. Joseph will help heal the ills of our time. And he was right. So after he did that, what happened? How did heaven respond? Another apparition. St. Joseph came again. Do you know where? Fatima. That's right. Now, you're probably thinking, oh, Father Calloway, you're, where seminary did you go to? That was Our Lady, Father. Right, right. But St. Joseph was also at Fatima at the last apparition, October 13th, 1917, when the sun gyrated and spun in the heavens and 70,000 plus people saw it, thought, you know, game over. It looked like it was going to collide and we're going to die. Right after that, the children, the three little visionary children, saw St. Joseph in the heavens holding the Christ child. And together, father and son, Joseph and Jesus, blessed the world. Fully approved aspect of the Fatima apparitions, but almost nobody knows about it. It's, it's vital to the, to the essence of Fatima. Why? Because we all want the triumph of Our Lady's Immaculate Heart, which means the, the, the triumph of Christ the King, which is what we all want, right? But are we going to get that when families are so messed up today, when like half of all marriages end in divorce, 75% of Catholics now believe in so-called homosexual marriage, 69% don't believe in the Eucharist? Is this the triumph? Nah. Nah. When are we going to get it? when we put the father back in families in his rightful role, when it's being done correctly, not just in the world, meaning human families, but even in the church. See, there's a reason you call me, Father Chris, and others, father. We need holy fathers. We need men who are loving, compassionate, <laughs> merciful, gentle, but also truthful, yes. and are willing to give you a spanking. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's true love hurts is tough love. They don't let the children just run and create more chaos and a mess in the house. Clean your room. That's what a real father does. And so we need this restored understanding of fatherhood in the world and in the church. I don't, you, you don't have to get into the crises that we've been having in the church of late. I mean, it's just, it's bizarro land. What, you know, and 
this stuff has been prophesied by Our Lady in like Akita in 1973, bishops against bishops, priests against priests in the public forum. It's pl- being played out today. That's what I mean, me and that, play for me, me and that social media thing, you know, because I'm like, oh, bro, bro. I'm like, what are you doing? You know? <laughs> and, and then I'm like, oh, it's just, it's crazy. But it's the times that we're living in. So this is happening. St. Joseph is on the scene, appearing in apparitions, unheard of stuff. And the church start to put so much emphasis on St. Joseph that we get the litany of St. Joseph. We didn't have a litany of St. Joseph until the beginning of the 20th century, an approved one. We get um, more feast days dedicated to St. Joseph, right? Communism was a real threat in the mid-20th century. And so, you know, the popes were saying we need to appeal to St. Joseph. And we got a new feast day on May 1st, St. Joseph the Worker, which was primarily meant to help us overcome the threat of communism. And it kind of worked, if you think about it. Now it's come back, right? We expelled the demon, but remember, they come back with seven more. So what do we got now? Socialism, Marxism, all these other things, basically the stepchildren of communism coming, and people rejoice, right? Young kids are going to college, and they're wearing Che Guevara shirts, thinking he's a great leader and a freedom fighter. You're clueless. You have no idea what this dude did and what he stood for and the people that he had killed. Absolutely. But this is the education system, right? So we need St. Joseph again to help us to, to combat these threats. And the Holy Spirit's been coming through. Unbelievable stuff has been happening. Do you know, it was only in 1962, I wasn't even born yet, that St. Joseph's name got put in the what? The Eucharistic prayer, right? Joseph and the Eucharist are so close. I mean, and, and again, as a priest, it's embarrassing for me to, to realize wait a minute, you mean back in the day, like even somebody like St. Andre Bassett, who was awesome, just our northern neighbor, you know, the greatest shrine dedicated to St. Joseph, he didn't even go to a mass where St. Joseph's name was in it? No. Neither did St. Teresa of Avila, neither did any of them prior to 1962. Joseph's name was not in the greatest of all prayers until 1962. Do you know how privileged we are to live right now? To hear that? It's unbelievable. They would have done anything back in the day to hear this, but they didn't. In heaven now they do, of course, but here we are, and we get to hear it every day. We can go and receive the Eucharist on a daily basis. We can hear Joseph's name in the Mass. We can have a Father who fights for us when the leaders close the churches. We can have a Father who fights for us when the family is in crisis and to bring us back to order. We can have a Father who comes to us right now in a time of absolute filth. What's the real plague on the planet right now? It ain't COVID, folks. You know what it is? Pornography. It is a plague, a poison to souls, and even women are falling prey to it today, which is, like, shocking, right? But so many men, the vast majority of men have fallen victim to pornography and all that it leads into, the mortal sins that follow through with it. Trust me, I can't tell you the details, but hearing confessions, nothing even compares Nothing comes close to it. And what's the fruit of that? Broken marriages, contraception, abortion, all kinds of sexual depravity all over the place. So what do we do? How do we get out of this? Joseph. Do you know that when I was doing the research for my book, um, I came across so much good material. And there was one by Venerable Mary of Agreda from Spain who's amazing. Oh my goodness, she's amazing. I'm actually going to be privileged in June to go to her tomb in Spain. Can't wait. That's going to be awesome. So she received messages from heaven, and one of them, um, she was given by Our Lady the privileges of devotion to Saint Joseph. Do you know what the first privilege of them are? Purity. Purity. My friends, I cannot tell you how much we need this today. When, when men are clicking that mouse or going on and watching these filthy things, discussing things that ruins the, a man's heart, Joseph right now is coming through in ways that are shocking me. I don't know. Did you see the interview with, um, is his name Michael Knowles, right? Is that the dude? Yeah. And Father Dan Rehill, who's a ex- priest exorcist up in uh, Tennessee, I think it is, right? So this priest, whom I know, he had so many, he's an exorcist. He, he like, you know, takes the devil out of people, you know? So he had, yeah, so 
he had people coming up, men coming up to him saying, Father, I'm in bondage to pornography. I've been for decades. I cannot break free. I've been to programs. I've been to this. I've been to that. It doesn't work. I don't know what to do. He gave him the consecration to St. Joseph. Do you know the amount of men who are being free from this addiction through consecration to St. Joseph right now is off the charts? Why? Because of the promise. It's a fruit of being devoted to him. And that's why we were given this right now. See, the 13th century, they didn't suffer from addiction to internet pornography. It didn't exist. Sure, they suffer from lust right from the beginning. But today, it's off the charts how this is affecting humanity. And it's no wonder, again, that God has given to us right now the man who has the most chaste heart. This man lived with the Immaculata, with the most beautiful woman ever to walk this planet. We, don't even, we can't even fathom how beautiful this woman was. And yet this man lived with her, and the marriage was never consummated. Do you know what integrity, what heroic virtue it takes for a man to live with such beauty and to yet have eyes that are chaste, a heart that is chaste, intentions that are pure, off the charts? This is St. Joseph. See, that's why in the early church they depicted him as being old. Seriously, they thought there is no way that a dude could live with such a woman. I mean, that's how I put it, but that's really how it, that's why they said that. But that is so lame. Are you saying that men can't be chaste, that they can't be pure? No, you don't have to wait till you're an old man and your, your libido is dead. You don't have to wait till, you know, there's no testosterone left in your body to be virtuous. That's not virtue at all. You're practically dead, right? <laughs> It's actually more virtuous for a young man who lives with such beauty to have restraint of his passions, to have his stuff in check constantly. That's, that's just the truth of it. I mean, look at what are all the Frasati the hottie, the girls say, right? Blessed Frasati. If that dude, young, handsome guy, could be a man of virtue, could not St. Joseph? Of course he could, and he was. So that's the model that men need to be looking to today to know how to treat women, to know how to honor them, respect them, serve them, die for them in this messed up time that we have. What is St. Joseph in his litany? The guardian of virgins, the protector of femininity. That's what we need today. My goodness, if we had that in households today, what a different culture we would have. What a different you know, environment that we would be living in. And so so many people have found strength, so many men have found strength in that. And then we had, in our lifetime, just a few years ago, never been done before, probably, won't happen again in our lifetime. I pray it does, but I doubt it. It only took us 2,020 years to get this one, the year of St. Joseph. Never had one before. Had a year of Our Lady, year of mercy, year of prayer, St. Paul, year of this, that, and the other, which are all awesome and great, but never had a year of St. Joseph until 2020. The perfect time. Oh my goodness, what a time. You know, do you know, you do, because you live through it. So much stress, so much anxiety. People lost their jobs. If you don't take that thing, you're fired, right? That's what people were up against, right? I can't tell you how many of those letters I cranked out trying to save people's jobs, right? Oh my goodness, it was unbelievable. How insane. How insane. So, Appealing to St. Joseph to give people hope, to give them peace, to give them comfort, to even find him a new job. You know how many people came up to me and said, Father, my husband lost the, his job over these issues. And now we don't know what to do. How are we going to pay the bills? we got five kids. We're, we're, we're going to be on the streets. They turned to St. Joseph. Do you know what happened? They get better jobs than they had before. Seriously. It's amazing. He is so untapped. He is such a reservoir of grace. He is greater than a Joseph of old, which says that he was put in charge of the storehouses of the grain. Our Joseph, as it says in the litany, is the one who dispenses the treasures of heaven. All of them. All of them. I mean, think about it. I love to think about this stuff because we know that when Our Lady, our dear mother, goes to Jesus... And simply, she doesn't even make a request. She just makes an observation. They have no wine. <laughs> Boom, right? I mean, they probably had to have like an AA meeting after that wedding because <laughs> he made so much wine. 
it's shocking actually how much wine he made. Because she simply said they, ha- they don't have any. Why did he do that? Because he loves his mom, right? Just like I love my mom. I'm not God or the Messiah. I'm not omnipotent. But if my mom comes up to me and says, Donnie, da-da-da-da-da, I'm going to be like, okay, yeah, okay, mom, I'm, I'm on it, right? And Because I love my mom. Jesus loves his mom. Well, Jesus also loves his dad, Joseph. And so if Joseph, now in heaven, brings a petition to him, if you're here down here, bless my husband who hates church and, uh, you know, is such a bad man, or <laughs> bless my delinquent children who are shacked up with their significant other in San Francisco or whatever it is, you know, <laughs> Please, St. Joseph, right? Help me, help me, help me. He's going to take those petitions to Jesus, his son, and Jesus is going to respond. It's not going to be unheard. Sure, things might not happen immediately. God's got a plan. He's got your best interest at hand. But it's going to have power, right? You go to certain saints for particular things. If somebody's got cancer, you go to St. Peregrine, right? You lose your car keys, right? Poor guy. He's got to be so sick and tired of that, you know? (laughs) He's like, again? (laughs) Or whatever, Saint. But Saint Joseph, all, everything. He takes care of everything. Why? Because he's your dad. He's your dad. He's your spiritual father. And he wants to help you. You know, if you think about it, these these are things that I love to, to, to just meditate upon. Right? They tell me, and maybe you can affirm this, ladies who are present, that when a baby says its first words... It's generally not mama. That's right. That's right. It's just easier in every culture for the baby to formulate that, right? Abba, dada, right? Instead of mama. I don't know why that is. I'm sure many mothers are secretly like, no, mama, mama, say mama, 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 right? I bet you do that, right? But if that is true... In all likelihood, what would the first words out of the mouth of the baby God, Jesus, have been? Abba. Looking at Joseph. And would Mary have been jealous like, no, I said mama. No, No, she wouldn't have done that. She would have rejoiced in that. See, that's another thing that we need St. Joseph today for in a special way is we're not in a competition, guys. Right? Right? Because today there's, there's a battle between the sexes of who wears the pants, of who rules the thing. Don't tell me what to do. I can open my own door. Thank you. Right? All this kind of nonsense. It's everywhere. I mean, you've even got dudes who suck at male sports. So they what? Say they're a woman and then go crush all the women in swimming because you suck as a dude in your own sport. Right? It's so obvious. You see what I mean? We're going to get canceled one of these days. <laughs> Divinemercyplus.org. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Father Chris, where is he? He's probably like, oh, Lord, I didn't know he was going to do this. You know? <laughs> okay. So, you know what I mean? So, we need to look to St. Joseph to be, yes, that loving man, that gentle man, but a good man, because you want to avoid the extremes. Today, there's so much confusion that some men, they don't know what it means to be a man, and so they basically want to be women. And they want to be only emotion and tenderness and compassion. No. You have to have those things, yes, of course, just like St. Joseph did. But on the other hand, you have to avoid being a machismo, you know, woman, make me breakfast, and being some caveman and treating people and using your authority and your strength in the wrong way, and you hurt people. That's not right. There's been a lot of men who have done that. And we have to avoid that. I mean, I have to say, I, I as a priest, I hear that all the time, and, and it, it breaks my heart as a priest. So many people will come up to me and they say, Father, my, my husband or a boyfriend that I had, they really hurt me, either emotionally or physically or, or sexually. And it's like, oh, I'm so sorry. It should not be this way. And it, it wounds especially a, 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 a growing feminine heart. Because a girl wants affirmation from her dad. She wants to be able to stand up on that coffee table and twirl around. Daddy, look, daddy, daddy, look, daddy, daddy, look. And when daddy looks and affirms the little princess, that does so much for that little girl. But when he doesn't, and when he verbally tears her down, what? Nah, why aren't you pretty as your sister? Why does your nose look like? Why is this? Why? Do you know what that does to a little girl? It makes her so insecure. 
that she'll grow up, she'll become a woman and, you know, get married or whatever, but she'll retain that insecurity. I see it played out so often. Even a woman who could be married to a great guy, she's always asking him, do you love me? Do you really love me? What do I got to do to prove my love for you? Because there were wounds from a man who used his strength in the wrong way. Think about our lady. Our lady is a woman. You know, oftentimes we, we, we picture our lady as like a robot or the saints like robots. It's like, okay, take one. Okay, okay, yeah, turn to the left. We've got a little shadow on your face, Mary, at the nativity scene. Okay, cut. All right, good. We're just going to stand here for seven years until you lose them in the temple. No, they had like a family life, right? They did things together. They took trips. I don't know if they threw a Frisbee. Whatever they did back then for recreation, they did it, right? They're normal people, you know, holy people, but normal people. But we forget that, and we forget that they were married. Yes, they did not engage in the conjugal act. It was a different kind of marriage because of the, for the sake of the mission, but they loved each other. That's what happens when you depict St. Joseph as an old guy. He's basically the grandfather of his own wife, and he's babysitting not only the child God, but this young girl. No, they were married. You don't get married because you're not in love. They loved each other. There would be probably the most pure, modest, amazing, we would probably pass out if we saw it, signs of affection in that marriage. Really. I mean, what does every woman like to do with her husband? She likes to you know, have a little peck on her, on her forehead, right? A little chaste peck, a sign of love, or just something so simple as a rose given to her, just a random rose, I don't know, no significant. When that stuff is done to a woman, oh my goodness, what it does to her heart. Can you imagine Joseph doing that to his lady? Because he would have. He loved her so much. He's the first one to call her my lady. He's the first knight. He's the greatest Marian saint of all time. Nobody comes close to him. Not even St. Louis de Montfort, St. Alphonsus Liguori, St. Maximilian Colby, John Paul II. Joseph smoked them all. He's the first one totally consecrated to the Blessed Virgin Mary. He's the greatest of all the saints. And Mary's feminine heart rested in his manhood. She's a girl. She has emotions, affections, a desire to be affirmed. Again, we just see her as stoic in a statue. You know, okay, yes, but... She's a girl. She had a heart. And she rested in the strength of her man. And that's what so many women need to do today, so that they have that comfortability of saying and being okay with, yes, my husband is the head of our house. I'm okay with that. Why? Because he's not using his manhood in the wrong way. He's willing to die for us. He's willing to put out the fires, take a bullet, and fight off the wolves to protect me, his beauty, and our children. That's what St. Joseph did for the Holy Family. You know, even the mystics talk about this, like Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich, Venerable Mary of and uh, what's that new one who's a servant of God? Mother Baige, something like that, right? I didn't put her in my book because she wasn't on her way to sainthood when my book came out, but now she is. Her book is amazing. They talk about when Joseph took his wife and their son to Egypt, That was a dangerous road. Bandits, robbers, young, beautiful woman, bad intentions. What was St. Joseph willing to do? Throw down, baby. Mm -hmm. By the way, that's why many saints and mystics say that that's why God did not allow St. Joseph to be at Calvary. Why? Because he would have kicked some butt. Right. As any father would. You try and hurt my son, it's on, baby. Right? Mm-hmm. And you're going to do this in front of my wife? No, nope. you know, gloves are coming off. Meet me behind the shed. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's over. He wouldn't have just sat on the sidelines. His strength would have been on full display, so he couldn't be at Calvary. No, no, no. He couldn't be. I'm not, this isn't me saying that. This is the saints and mystics saying this. See, this is why we need this understanding of manhood today, based on St. Joseph, to fight the battles of our time, in a loving, compassionate, merciful, kind way. I always got to throw that in there because everybody's always like, oh, Father, you got to say loving. Duh, right? <laughs> Obviously. But you got to do it like St. Joseph. You got to do it in the right way. Wouldn't it be awesome if today, I don't even know if they still do this today because so many kids don't have dads today, but back in the day, you would describe like your mom or dad to the class. My mom's a teacher or my mom's a whatever or my dad does this. Or, you know, imagine if, 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 at show and tell one day in school, little Johnny stands up 
and shows a picture of his dad. Thank God he's got one. And he says, my dad is the pillar of our family. My dad is the glory of our home life. My dad is the guardian of virgins. My dad is a terror of demons. Wouldn't that be awesome? Sure it would. And why is St. Joseph the terror of demons, by the way? Why is that? It's fascinating. Two reasons. There's a lot, but two main ones. His paternity, because paternity has power. It has strength. The devil knows that. He doesn't want you to know it. Because again, when, when Joseph goes to Jesus, Jesus hears it as a son. Sure, Dad, consider it done. If it's what you want, I know it's in accord with what I want. It's done. It has power. And his purity. St. Joseph's purity is, oh my goodness, it's a weapon against the filthy, pornographic creature that the devil is. If you're not pure, you don't have power. If you don't have purity in your life, you are spiritually impotent. And the devil ain't worried about you. That's why so many men today are not a threat to the devil. The devil ain't worried about them because they keep falling into mortal sins through pornography. Seriously. But when you're pure, you have power and you're a terror to demons. That's why men need to look to St. Joseph. It's why women need to look to St. Joseph to understand what it means to have a true man in your life. So many young girls today come up to me, Father, I want a man. I can't find one. Where are all the good men? They're all in the seminary. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I get it. Yeah. Well, every now and then one falls out, sister, so get ready, you know, so, you know. Matter of fact, I remember a few years ago, Father Chris might remember this, Father Matt Tomini, one of our guys, great guys, director of the shrine, good man, and a handsome young fellow, right? So I remember at Steubenville, there was a young lady who was like really into him. And I never told him until after he was ordained because I didn't want him having no ideas. You know, she was a cutie. And I was like, nah, we'll tell him after he was ordained. So I did, you know, so anyway. So my friends, go to St. Joseph right now for mercy. I've got my own titles for St. Joseph. I call him the patriarch of divine mercy. I try the apostle of divine mercy, the, 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 the beneficiary of divine mercy. I've got a whole bunch of these titles. We need him right now. You need him in your individual life. You need him in your marriage. You need him in your family. You need him in your parish. Bring him. Do the consecration, which I'm, I know so many of you are, have already done it. Do it again. Do it with your parish. Ask your father in a nice, gentle way, because they sometimes freak out. Oh, great, another consecration. You know, <laughs> I understand. But it, it, it really does transform things. It helps in tremendous ways. And lastly, I'll end with this. Um, it's not out yet, but just to give you a little taste of what's coming, I've got a graphic novel coming out on St. Joseph. It's going to be good. It's a comic book, right? But it's for adults too. And it's going to be so good. The artwork in it, this artist Sam Estrada, a Filipino-American guy, can draw like you've never seen anybody draw. It's done. I think it's actually at the printers, and we're fine-tuning some things. It'll come out in June. It's called The Chaste Heart of St. Joseph. So when that comes out, get a copy of that. It's really going to be good stuff. You're really going to love that. Kind of the follow-up to Consecration to St. Joseph. So my friends, I can't thank you enough for coming today. To be a part of our Marian family, to pray for us, to pray with us, to support us, to have our six when the enemy comes after us. Father Chris and I need you guys for that. And remember, what's the website? DivineMercyPlus.org, right. Because after talks like this, yeah, we're probably going down at some point. So... Go to Joseph. God bless you, my friends. Thanks. Okay, everybody, I know it's tight. We, we apologize. It's a, it's a cramped area, but we're going to take a little bit of a break. If you need to use the restrooms, uh, please do. But we're going to try to start back up uh, by about 11 o'clock. So if you could uh, try to do what you could do, stretch your legs, but we'll get ready. God bless you.
Um, we're on a live stream, so what we're going to try to do is get started to keep the schedule going. And we're grateful that you could be with us. Let us begin with a prayer in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, on this amazing day of grace, this weekend of many, many, many merciful benefits and graces that you give to us, we ask that we open our minds and hearts to receive this grace. And through the intercession of St. Faustina, may Almighty God bless all here, our loved ones and our families and our friends, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Okay, so thank you again, everybody, for coming. What I'm going to do here is I took some core things from talks I've done in the past, but I've added a bunch of new stuff that I think is very important. But we're going to give you a recap, uh, exactly what you need to do to get the graces of Divine Mercy Sunday. But again, I've added some things, and I've uh, you know I've made a change in in, in, in different things. So, uh, by the way, um, you know they're talking about where's all the good men. You know where's all the good men? They're all in seminary. Well, one of the good men that was in seminary that dropped out is cameraman Giuseppe. So he's over here. So cameraman Giuseppe. So, so, so the nice young ladies at home. And, and Father Don is awesome. You guys all know Father Don and I love the Filipinos. They love, we love the Filipinos. And so we mean this with all love, but Father Don says it best. And he says, Father, if you don't become a priest, I have a beautiful daughter. <laughs> I, I love that, and, and, and we mean that with all love and respect. All right, now, I'm going to start with something that Father Don talked about, and yes, it is very true. we got to be very careful uh, what's going on in the world today, this woke culture. I'm not, that's not going to be the topic of this talk, but just to finish with what Father Don was saying, I added a couple quick things here. I don't know if you guys know, uh, you know, the world, well, you do know this, the world is in a mess, but do you know this family? Does anybody know this family? Mark Hauk, right? All right. Pro-life. Had a al slight altercation, defended his son, praying out in front of abortion clinic. Family of seven. They are listed by the FBI as a terrorist family. All right. Threatened by the FBI as a team of 25 Agent showed up with shields and long guns. They showed up. They threatened this man with 11 years in prison. The Department of Justice, all right, all this because he defended his son in an abortion clinic. This is what our Department of Justice is after. They tried everything. I don't know if it's over. It may be, but... They were pushing 11 years of prison. Now, just recently, on record, a transgender, violent person attacked a Catholic church. This is on video of the security camera. See the rock? They have the video of them smashing the window this is the transgender, desecrated the altar, desecrated the altar, smashed it, spray painted the church with words that started with an F, assaulted one of the employees that tried to get him to stop, or her, whatever you call it. This was an assault. The Department of Justice said no jail time recommended no jail time whatsoever. What is going on? We are in a mess. We are in a mess. The only answer, divine mercy. Divine mercy. It's the only answer. It's the only answer. Jesus said, souls perish in spite of my bitter passion. I am giving them the last hope of salvation. Please underline that. The last hope of salvation. That is the feast of my mercy tomorrow. 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 
If they will not adore my mercy, they will perish for all eternity. Can any of you go before our Lord and say, why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you warn me? Here it is. They will perish for all eternity. Secretary of my mercy. Who's he talking to? Faustina. Right. Tell all souls about this great mercy of mine because the awful day, the day of my justice is near. That was 92 years ago. Can he be more patient with us? Can he? <clears throat> now, Jesus says, if you don't pass through the doors of my mercy, you must pass through the doors of my justice. John Paul too. There's nothing the world needs more than mercy. But you know what? If you might be sitting there, and I know there's some of you, oh yeah, this is good, Father, but it ain't going to change the way the world's in a mess, right? Well, let me tell you. We have a priest. He was supposed to be here today. But he got delayed. If you haven't met him already, Father Richard Shabu. He's a uh, Nigerian priest that's been with us marrying fathers from the past. I can't explain what this guy personifies the priesthood and divine mercy. Boko Haram terrorist group kidnapped seven religious, six priests and a nun, and held them hostage in Nigeria, took them out into the woods, demanded ransom. Nobody, not even in the Catholic Church, got involved because you know how that works, right? You pay the ransom, it just empowers them to come back, kidnap more, demand more money. This is their game. Father Richard got involved, risked his life, risked his life, and they went into, took them three days just to hike in, was sicker than you can imagine. And so he got them out. And in the meantime, these terrorists were fascinated with Father Richard. These are all Islamic terrorists, Boko Haram, fascinated. So Father Richard gets the release. He's saying mass at his little church in Nigeria, and 12 terrorists bust in in the middle of mass with explosives strapped under their clothes. They were going to blow up the church in the name of Allah. Father Richard is saying the mass. They come in, there's 12 of them. And they come in and Father Richard just exudes holiness, mercy, and love. I, I, I can't even explain. If you ever see this guy and he, he'll be up here on the hill, he's going to come here for two months telling you that's Jesus visiting our our hill and he's coming we think next month you can ask for father Richard Shabu we have two father Richards but Richard Shabu just from Nigeria so they come in strapped with explosives to blow up the church and father Richard starts praying and all of a sudden the leader falls to his knees and had a vision of Mary and Jesus. And he fell down and the other 11 are there. And the leader falls down, sees the Jesus and Mary and literally gets up and tells them, Jesus is God. Jesus is real. This is... This is what happens. Now, it doesn't end there. Father Richard talks them out. They do not use their explosives. Instead of calling the police, Father Richard talks with them, meets with them. All of a sudden, this man has this conversion. The other 11 are kind of watching. Father Richard starts talking to them. 
They're all now in the Catholic Church. Can you believe that? That is incredible. That's Father Richard in the middle. These others here were the members of Boko Haram. Those are all terrorists that gave up and laid their guns down. They literally came to Father Richard. I can't even imagine. And they came to Father Richard with their automatic weapons and laid them at his feet. This is Father Richard. Right there. Amazing. There they are. And I'm just like, Father Richard, if I could ever be half the priest you are. This is Christ. And so Father Richard... The example, the leaders saw Jesus and Mary and the others followed in conversion. That's what divine mercy can do. You don't think it can convert your son who just plays video games? If it can convert 12 terrorists, <laughs> it can convert your son. <laughs> Amazing. And so people are just like, but father, I mean, this divine mercy thing, it's optional, it's just devotions. And my priest says devotions, you know, you, you really shouldn't put a lot of emphasis on them. All right, there's a big point here. Yes, devotions are optional, but not this one because this is a devotion to God. It's not a devotion, believe it or not, to St. Anthony or, or, or even Mary and Joseph, as powerful as that is. Divine mercy is a devotion to God, all right? This is devotion to Jesus himself, not the saints. And so, I mean, my life was changed. When I think back to my conversion, a lot of you know the story. Really, I'm here because God brings a greater good out of even the worst evil. God brings, you know, that's divine mercy. And, and, and my priesthood came from the suicide of my grandmother. And God brings his greater good out of anything, but really the first spark that changed me to come back to the church was a simple line in the diary that says, if you pray this chaplet even once, you will have the graces necessary for salvation. Think about those words. You pray this chaplet even once. Wow, does that sound does that sound unimportant? What about this? Well, it's not biblical, Father. Oh, yeah? 1 John 2, chapter 2, verse 2. He's the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only ours, but the sins of the whole world. What does that sound like? The chaplet of divine mercy. You know why the chaplet was given? Now, those who really watch the Marian talks... You can go way back on this one. The chaplet was given to stop abortion. St. Faustina saw an angel ready to strike at the city of Warsaw, right? Strike at the city of Warsaw. And all of a sudden, she was given words in her heart on what to pray to stop the, the angel from striking. And Jesus told her, when you go into the chapel, pray these words. And these words rendered that angel helpless. What was the angel going to do? It was going to strike at the most beautiful city in Poland. All right. Now, it does not say in the diary why, but later they asked Blessed Michael Sapochko, her confessor, what this was all about. And he had asked St. Faustina what this was all about. And you know what she told him? What Faustina told Michael Sapochko? That that chaplet was given. And why was the angel going to strike at Warsaw? Because Warsaw was the abortion capital of Europe. Now also, St. Faustina writes in her diary in detail that she got the most excruciating pains, the most horrible pains in her stomach between the hours of 8 and 11 p.m., this is in the diary. You can read it. And Sapochko asked her about it. They know for a fact that the abortion clinics in Warsaw did a vast majority of their abortions between 8 and 11 p.m. So Faustina had this horrible pain 
And she asked Jesus, now this is in the diary. And she asked Jesus, what is this? And he said, this is an atonement for the sins of mothers who murder the children in the womb. This is in the diary. And so he gave her that chaplet because the justice of God was going to have the angel strike at the city of Warsaw. And so the angel's getting ready to strike and Faustina sees this. God gave her a vision of it. And so Faustina's scared to death. All of a sudden these words come to her, for the sake of my sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. And she kept repeating the words that we now know as the chaplet. And then this angel was helpless. He could not strike. Why? Because he was going to strike for the sin of abortion. This is the power of the chaplet. This is not just optional. The chaplet. What about the novena? The novena is powerful. Uh, If you're around today at three o'clock, I will be giving a talk out at the outdoor shrine on the ninth day of the novena about lukewarm sinners. We invite all of you to come at three o'clock. We're going to do the chaplet together. And it's about lukewarm sinners. We're going to talk to you the power of novena. Now, the novena of divine mercy is unique. Father Don mentioned if you lose something, you pray to St. Anthony. If you have cancer, you pray to St. Peregrine. What do you pray for in the divine mercy novena? It's the only novena we have that's not our intentions. It's God's intentions. All right, so this is powerful. Uh, What about, we all know this, the image of divine mercy. All right, more powerful words from Jesus. The soul that venerates this image will never perish. Again, powerful. We know the rays, all right? These rays are everything, and it's tied to divine mercy. Why? Because Satan, you've heard me say this before. Now, this is the recap part of my talk. We're going to get into other stuff. But Satan only has two tools, sin, and what's the result of sin? Death. And so... What we have in the rays of of divine mercy are the ways to to crush those two tools of Satan. Satan's first great tool is sin. What wipes away sin? The cleansing waters of baptism and confession, the white ray, the water. The cleansing waters of baptism and confession wipe out the first tool of Satan, sin. What's the second tool of Satan? The result of sin, death. What wipes out death? Life. What was life to the Jews? Blood. And so we have the blood. This is amazing. This is what we have. Now, the image comes with so much protection. Speaking of Warsaw, do you know that Hitler was so furious at the Warsaw Uprising, I think it was 1944, that he ordered the complete leveling of the entire city of Warsaw? All right, so Hitler, uh, who they pretty much know was, was possessed, This was his reaction to the Warsaw Uprising in World War II. He leveled the city. They have documentation that there was, and Father Seraphim taught me this, there was something like four or five buildings in the entire old section or wherever it was that the the leveling was. Everything was leveled to the ground. There was like four or five buildings left. They have it documented that every one of those had the image of divine mercy in them. This is documented. They have this. And this is, this is to me, an amazing fact. Okay? And so, um, what, about, what about this one? Have you guys seen this on our website? Have you guys seen this? The, you haven't seen this story. You got to look this one up. This, this one here is a story. Of, the guy's name is Ron Regalis. And um, he was in, in Long Island. We have some Long Island guests here. That, oh, here they are right here. So we have, yes, here's our other ladies. Wonderful. Um, so this was when Hurricane Sandy was ripping up the coast. His neighborhood was right in the direct line, going to get just blown away. And everybody's packing up, moving out. He consecrates his house to, to the protection of divine mercy. And he takes out the image into the face of the storm. Everybody else is leaving, holds the image up under the protection of the image to to protect his house. He leaves. Everybody leaves. The storm rolls in, destroys that whole section. Uh, His neighborhood is wiped out. All the houses, trees through the roofs, windows blown out, everything. And all of a sudden, in the midst of all this destruction, is this perfectly untouched house. 
And what he said was amazing is uh, the fact that the water, the floodwaters had come up and flooded all the houses. And the water went all the way around his house and never into the house. And again, this is not a magic wand or a rabbit's foot, but it's trust. What is the essence of the message of God in divine mercy? Trust. In fact, Abraham was not so much the father of faith as he was the father of trust because God asked him to sacrifice the boy by which he said, all the progeny, all the, the, the descendants of Israel will come through this boy, right? All of them. Didn't say through Ishmael. They said through Isaac. And he said, the, the, your descendants will be as great as the stars of the sky or sands on the seashore. And all of a sudden, you're asking me to kill this little guy? You're asking me to kill him? Well, that little guy is a perfect typology of Christ. Do you know that they hiked for three days to get to the place where Abraham was going to sacrifice him? The father offered his son. Sound familiar? Do you know on both sides of them, they had two attendants? And so Isaac, who was going to be sacrificed, had a man on his left and a man on his right as they traveled. Do you know that he carried the wood up the hill for the sacrifice? Now, I mean, come on, this is amazing. And then all of a sudden, the father who's willing to offer the son has been told that all the descendants will come through this little boy and now you're asking me to kill him? Like, I got to have some trust here. So Abraham's just like, okay, Lord, I don't know how you're going to do it, but somehow you're, you're asking me to kill this little guy. Somehow you're going to fulfill your promise I trust, even if you got to raise this little guy from the dead. This is trust. <laughs> trust is the vessel. You all want to get to heaven? I want to get to heaven? You heard me say before, you can't get to heaven but with, without grace. Grace. Grace is the way to get to heaven. But trust is the vessel by which all grace is received. Now, people still say, well, Father, this is optional. Divine Mercy Sunday is not optional. <laughs> all right. Now, why? Why do I say that? Because the Sacred Congregation for Divine Worship, April 30th, 2000, formalized this declaration when John Paul put it on the universal, or when he put it as declared it as a feast. They formalized this declaration and by its inclusion in the Roman Missal made it binding throughout the universal church. Did you hear that? This is the little note you can give to your parish priest that says this is optional. You know why the parish priest thinks it's optional? You know why they think that? Faulty translation. Good people listen to these talks. <laughs> you see? That's Tanya. Tanya, Tanya is one of our Marian all-stars. You know what's funny? Because I check, I read every comment we ever get. And... Every comment we ever get, I read. Now, I can't answer them all. There's not enough time. But I, and I can't get to them all. And I get back to my room usually about midnight from the office every night. And then I try to sit down and answer these comments. I'm like, I read the comment. I'm like, oh, geez, that's a long one. I have to get on and I click on it. Tanya and Karen have already answered it for me. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and so, so that, that's an awesome part of our Marian family. So, but anyway, why they think this is because the Roman Missal says the second Sunday of Easter or Divine Mercy Sunday. Now, when you think or, it's optional. I want an apple or an orange. But doesn't or also refer to the same thing? What's parked out there? A car or an automobile? Ooh, they're the same thing. <laughs> So the wording of the Missal translated from the Latin, the word seyu actually is not second Sunday of Easter or Divine Mercy Sunday. That's a mistranslation. It's actually the second Sunday of Easter that is Divine Mercy Sunday. Namely, Divine Mercy Sunday. It's not optional. And God bless our priests, but we got to educate them. Pope Benedict said Divine Mercy is not a secondary devotion, but an integral part of Christian life and prayer. He said Divine Mercy the message of divine mercy is the nucleus of the gospel. If something's the nucleus of the gospel, does that sound optional? 
No. When John Paul, when he canonized St. Faustina in 2000, did you know this? He met with the Marians. John Paul, that die, that night, met with the Marian fathers. And he met with the Marian priests and brothers, and he said, and I quote this. This is what he told us Marians. Now, I wasn't there yet. I believe the reason I was made pope was for divine mercy. Basically, to canonize Sister Faustina and institute the Feast of Divine Mercy. This is the happiest day of my life. That's John Paul. How come we never hear about that? And even St. Faustina, she saw her own canonization. She wrote about this. She saw her own canonization. This is amazing. And you know this story? I've never told this too often, but I tell you, this one is worth saying again. St. Faustina, before she passed away, back in the 1930s, she died October 5th, 1938, which, by the way, is cameraman Giuseppe's birthday. So, <laughs> so he needed St. Faustina to look out for him, so that's why. But what we, what we have in the diary, St. Faustina wrote very clearly, is that she saw the Holy Father and she saw the Holy Father. And she, this is in the diary. And she saw St. Peter. And there's the Holy Father, she said, sitting at this massive gathering. It was her own canonization. And she saw St. Peter. And she wrote in the diary, I saw St. Peter whisper in the Holy Father's ear. Now, if you've seen this, it's amazing. If you watch John Paul II, if you've seen the clip of this event, John Paul II was looking up like he was in a trance. There was no plans to announce. There was nothing that was leaked or any announcement that we were going to be making divine mercy in addition to canonization of Faustina, which was planned, that they were going to institute the feast of divine mercy. And all of a sudden, John Paul II looks like he's in a trance. That's when St. Faustina was watching St. Peter go up and whisper in his ear. And all of a sudden, he declares the feast of divine mercy. In my opinion, St. Peter went to his ear and he said, now is the time of mercy. And John Paul II announced it. This is amazing. And you know the story of John Paul II? He died. Uh, Cardinal Jeevich was right here at the shrine. His right-hand man for 40 years, his, his, uh, his secretary, 40 years he served John Paul. He came here. He was here. Some of you might have been here. Celebrated mass, met with us, and he told us an incredible story. You all know the story of John Paul II dying, right? That story is unbelievable. Cardinal Jeevitz said it was the night before Divine Mercy. He had already been to daily mass, had gone to confession, but he wasn't going to do mass again to the next day, which was Divine Mercy Sunday. Cardinal Jeevitz says, all of a sudden, about 5 o'clock, which you now can celebrate the vigil for the Feast of Divine Mercy, he got this inspiration to celebrate Mass for Divine Mercy Sunday with John Paul. He ignored it. Then about an hour later, this feeling came back, celebrate Mass with John Paul II for Divine Mercy Sunday. This is on the vigil, and he ignored it. Finally, it's about 8.30, and the Holy Spirit convicted him to celebrate Mass for Divine Mercy Sunday. The whole time, John Paul II was getting weaker and weaker, and he said... <clears throat> He said, this time he listened. Can you imagine? I always say, cardinal rummaging through, getting purificators and corporals. And, and he celebrated Mass for Divine Mercy Sunday with John Paul II. He received Holy Communion and died 25 minutes later. That is the gift that he got from God, from Divine Mercy. Now, this is why we have this gift on this one day. I'm going to give you a quick summary now. This is what I've been talking about the last couple of days, and then we're going to move on to something else. But i got to repeat this because this is, if, you, if there's one person in here who hasn't heard it, you need to hear this. What is Divine Mercy, okay? And what is the Feast of Divine Mercy? All right, first of all, Divine Mercy is basically... The love of the Trinity, which the, the Trinity has perfect love within itself. When that perfect love between the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit goes outside of itself, we have mercy. And when, when that love went outside of itself, what did we have? Creation, right? So you all know that, the first act of mercy. Now, we all know it's defined. Father Seraphim used to define it as loving the unlovable and forgiving the unforgivable. Please, if you have any unforgiveness in your heart, I beg you, please get to confession today. 
There's priests here in confessions all day. Nobody is worth losing your soul over. No matter what they've done. I know there's some horrible things that people have done to one another. I get it. I get it. I do. But nobody is worth losing your soul over. I always use that example, how ironic that somebody who did something horrendous to you could end up in heaven and you in hell because of it. Father, how's that possible? All right, that person who did the horrendous thing, they repent. They go to confession. They tell you they're sorry. They tell God they're sorry. You reject it. Uh Uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. You refuse to forgive. You didn't do anything wrong. They did. I shouldn't have to forgive them. You don't forgive them. They repent. They feel terrible. What they did was wrong. They know it was wrong. They can end up in heaven. You, who refuse to forgive, absolutely will never forgive them. You could be lost. How ironic. That is why you got to get to confession, especially if you have any of unforgiveness. Now, the absolute powerful thing here is, is okay, so Father Seraphim defined mercy as loving the unlovable, forgiving the unforgivable. I've always gone with the definition of it's a particular mode of love. It's the highest form of love. That when love encounters suffering, it takes action to do something about it. It doesn't just sit there, right? And so God, what did he do when he saw our suffering in the garden? The gift of a savior and the promise, or the promise of a savior and the gift of a mother, right? This is what God did for us. Okay, now, so Jesus said that I want this feast on the Sunday after Easter. Again, this is going to be a quick recap, then we'll move on, but this is so important. Jesus said he wants the feast of his mercy in, on, I should say, the Sunday after Easter. That has to be on this day. Why? Why? Because it completes what we call an octave. If you've listened to our talks, you've heard this. Basically, when a feast is so big that it can't be celebrated in one day, the church celebrates it over eight days. It's all one day. Do you know that we're in Easter right now? This is Easter, right? So we ate meat yesterday. And, um, and so, wait a minute, yeah, yeah, yesterday, Friday, Friday. So, so we can because it's, it's the huge, biggest celebration of the year in the church, right? And so this eight days is what we call an octave now. Here's where it gets really interesting. So Jesus said, I want divine mercy Sunday, the Sunday after Easter. Why? Because it's part of this octave. Now, the first day of the octave, you all know I've taught you this before, is divine, or excuse me, Easter Sunday. Easter Sunday, day one of the octave, day one. So you have Easter Sunday, day one, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Divine mercy Sunday, the eighth day. Why is this important? Recap, because... On Easter Sunday, Jesus opened the door to heaven. The next seven days, because seven is the perfect number to the Jews, you've heard me say, regarding time, eternity. So the next seven days are your pilgrimage on, uh, called life. But it is on that eighth day. And what did eight mean to the Jews? Eternity. Eight represented eternity to the Jews. So on that eighth day, you are going to enter into eternity. And Christ is the groom. And on your eighth day, guess who you're going to meet? You're Christ. You are the bride. And Jesus wants to take you home into the bridal chamber. That's what the sanctuary is. The holy of holies. The bridal chamber. What happens in the bridal chamber? Consummation. What happens? God, the groom, we, the bride, it's united. It's consummated. Father Don talked about cancel culture. Here's my cancel culture. Here it is. Here it is. I'm going to get canceled. People always say all the time, why isn't the church more open to women priests? It's not sexism. It's not chauvinism. This is not what it's about. At the altar, who is that priest? In persona Christi. He's in the person of Christ. Christ was a male. We can't change that. At the altar, the whole nuptial meaning of the Mass is a wedding. And in this, the church fathers teach us that Christ is the groom. And who's the priest at the altar? He's Christ. From that altar comes the seed. The seed goes out from the altar. The male, who produces the seed? The male. And that is received by what? The female. And who's the feminine? 
the church, the church receives that seed given from the priest, the male from the altar. The church, this is why we call her mother church, is the feminine. She receives that seed. She fosters it. She gives birth. That's the whole essence of life. And my cancel culture is this. If you have no offense, men and women are equal but different. We have different roles, different skill sets. I mean, let me tell you, when I was a little kid and I fell and hurt my knee, I didn't go running to my dad. I went running to my mom <laughs> because I knew I was going to get empathy. My dad was going to, if I went running to my dad, you know, there's my dad, Vietnam vet, uh, helicopter pilot, flew out of Da Nang. My dad would have looked at me and said, you're crying over that? <laughs> get back in the ball game. And, and, and so we went to mom. We have different skill sets. But if that altar, if you place a woman to give that seed to the feminine of the church, you have lesbianism. It's lesbianism. The meaning of the whole essence of the mass is the nuptial between the man and the woman. And so this is what happens, as you've always heard me say, when you come up this aisle, well, there's no aisle now, but when you come up, you receive the groom as they're waiting for you at the altar, just like a Catholic wedding. And so this is why we have to have it. This is why this day is so important. Because when we enter into eternity, Christ the groom wants to take us, the bride, home with him. He wants us to meet who? His mother and his father. Right? But before he can do that, what did every Jewish man want his bride to be? Spotless. Spotless. And so this is the whole meaning. And so when Christ comes for us at the end of time, is he going to find us spotless? Let me tell you, if he didn't clean us up, he ain't going to find anybody spotless. So he's got to clean us up. How does he clean us up? All right, let's start with confession. Confession is, yes, how God cleans us up from the stain of sin. But Catholic teaching has always been that after you come out of that confessional, while the, the eternal punishment due to sin, hell, that's wiped away. Most likely, your temporal punishment remains. Unless you are so full of perfect contrition, unless you are so sorry, and you're on your hands and knees, bawling your eyes out, crying up and down that you are so sorry to do it, what you did, and you'll never do it again, unless you have that level of contrition, you have punishment remaining. Guess what, everybody? When Christ comes for you on the eighth day, He's not going to be able to take you home yet. You've got some work to do. Now, purgatory, non-Catholics attack us all the time. You're telling me that Jesus did not finish the completion of the forgiveness of sins on the cross and that we need purgatory. What do you answer that? Do we believe, do we as Catholics, why do we believe that purgatory is for the forgiveness of sins? You're all wrong. Purgatory does not exist for the forgiveness of sins. The sins were forgiven in the confessional. You don't make it to purgatory if you die in any state of unrepentant mortal sin. You're lost. But with the mercy of God, we're forgiven in the confessional. Well, then, Father, what the heck's purgatory for? Purgatory is to detach from those sins that I've been forgiven from, but I'm still holding on to. Father Don talked about pornography, all right? I could go to the confessional or alcoholism. P take your pick. I can go into the confessional and confess, you know, Father, I fell, I, uh, you know, back in my 20s, okay? I go in the confessional. Father, I fell. I looked at an image of an adult woman on the internet and I messed up, all right? You're forgiven of the sin. But two days later, I fell right back into it, right? You're attached. You need to break that attachment. That's the purpose of purgatory, what else is the purpose of purgatory? And it's not the forgiveness of sins. What else does purgatory do for you? It atones for the sins that you've already been forgiven of. The boy in the window, you've all heard my example. Father says, don't play baseball in the yard. Boy plays baseball, breaks the window. Dad comes home, says you're forgiven, but you're grounded and you're paying for this out of your allowance. He still forgave him. This is where the Protestants don't understand it. 
The boy was forgiven. Jesus forgave you in the confession. He forgave you on the cross. But you still have to pay for the consequence. And no good father is going to say, well, you broke the window. I told you not to. Go have fun with your friends now. That's not a good dad. So purgatory also is for the purpose of atoning for the consequences of your sin. And what's the third reason for purgatory? All this is purification. So what's the third purpose? Prepare you for heaven. What does the bride do before meeting the groom? She gets all cleaned up. She gets all ready. This is her job. She wants to look beautiful. You too will be happy for purgatory. You know who they say you'll be happiest for the most when you die? The people who annoyed you the most. All right? Cameraman Giuseppe's my way to heaven. <laughs> no, I love Cameraman Giuseppe. I love Cameraman Giuseppe. I couldn't imagine doing what we do without that guy. So you will be most thankful for those who annoyed you the most because the way to heaven is the cross. And those who annoy you are giving you cross after cross after cross. So this is what it is. So this eighth day, all this comes out, all right? And so Jesus gives us an opportunity to be cleansed of those stains that'll be prohibiting us from getting to heaven. What are they? Sin, and the result of sin is punishment. We just mentioned that you can wipe away in purgatory. Now, if Jesus comes for you on the eighth day, eighth day represents eternity, eighth day is the day you die, and you have any stain of sin on your soul, what do you got to do? Get to confession. That's why the first thing Jesus said to do in the promise, go to confession. Now, if you've been to confession, but you're still attached to some of your sins, gluttony, impatience. I mean, okay, so I say it all the time. You've heard my videos. It's like, okay, we're all works in progress, right? I mean, I know my sins. I know my sins. Lord, I, I sound like a broken record, all right? Gluttony, Little Debbie snack cakes. I mean, <laughs> I, I'm going to be in purgatory for years for those things. It's, it's just a fact. Lord, help me here. And, and, and so gluttony. What about patience? All right. So sometimes God intervenes. You know, when G-Man and I, we, I call him G-Man, cameraman Giuseppe, we got this, this long day. We've been working like crazy. We got deadline after deadline. And Mary Clark goes over to me and she says, Father Chris, you know, you still by tomorrow, i got to do this and this and this and this and this and this and this. And Mary looks up at me. She says, I'm so stressed out. I'm like, it's me, not you. So we're trying to get all this stuff done. And, and, and I'm usually really impatient with this kind of stuff. I'm like, why didn't we do this earlier? Why didn't we do this? Blah, 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 blah. So we go and we film. I'm exhausted. So cameraman Giuseppe sets up the camera inside the shrine. I can't get it right. I, I, I start again, and I'm trying to explain and, and give the teaching. I can't get it. I can't get it. And I'm starting to teach again, and I can't get it. And I'm just like, oh, my gosh, I can't get this. I can't get this. I can't get this. So I stop. I'm like, oh, all right, all right. Pray. Let's regroup. So finally, I get it. And I went through the whole thing, not having to stop, not having to retake. I nailed the whole thing. And all of a sudden... <laughs> Cameraman Giuseppe looks up and he says, um, we're going to have to redo this. And, and I said, why? And he says, I forgot to hit record. Now, sometimes God intervenes because I went like this and no words could come out of my mouth. No words. And Giuseppe, well, actually, I should say the important part. Before I did that, before I opened my mouth, cameraman Giuseppe did the key thing. He looked at me and he says, have mercy on me. <laughs> so after he says, I forgot to hit record, he knew the magic words. So after he says, I forgot to hit record, and I'm, Ah! He lays it on me. Have mercy on me. And not a single word could come out of my mouth. Not a single word. God intervened. 
God intervened and said, I'm sticking up for cameraman Giuseppe. <laughs> and so that was the time that I stopped. I put my head down and I said, okay, we're going to do it again. <laughs> and I smiled. And G-Man, after laying that, have mercy on me. How could you get angry with that? That's what cameraman Giuseppe taught me that day. The patience. So if we have any impatience, purgatory. If we have any gluttony, purgatory. This will be broke. So if we have any of these stains on our, on our, on our soul, God can't take us to heaven. We either don't make it because we got unrepentant mortal sin and we're lost, or we got to stop over in purgatory until we clean up and get rid of the attachments. You get the point? So now God wants us to be with him in heaven. So he gives us another way, and there's many ways to clean up a sin and punishment, like plenary indulgences, but you've heard me say, those you have to have no attachment to sin, it's hard. But he gives us another way, divine mercy Sunday. And Jesus says on that day, the soul that has been to confession, that wipes away the sin. And the soul that goes to holy communion, that wipes away through the grace of this day, all the punishment. He says that soul will be completely cleansed. You will be ready for heaven. Now, people always say to me, Father, geez, if I could just clean my slate, if I could just do a redo, if I could just go through my life and clean up and redo the mess. Now you can. Everything is cleansed. Everything is forgiven. Now, it's, again, you've always heard me say this. It's not a magic wand or a rabbit's foot. You got to have rectification of the will. If you're living in sin, you can't just be like, oh, you know, hey, uh, I can continue now. You know, it's funny because, you know, mercy can be too much, okay? Father Walter Gurgel. Have anybody, you, have you, you, this was a man beyond a man. This was one of our priests. Father Walter Gurgel was so incredible. His mercy was off the charts. You could go to Father Gurgel for confession, and you could say, Father, I just embezzled $100,000 from my company. I just cheated on my wife for the 50th time. I'm cheating on my taxes. I'm not going to church. I'm not doing this. I'm not doing that. And he would go, be beautiful confession, beautiful <laughs> confession. And I'm like, Father, did you just hear my confession? And, 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 and so mercy is, that's the mercy of God. It's greater than any sin. It's greater than any sin we could ever commit. God's mercy. I said this morning at the mass, I'd like to share a quick story with you. My uncle, my great uncle, actually he's my dad's uncle, was in World War II. And uh, he was the third man over the Remagen Bridge. And uh, God bless those soldiers, man. Those were, the, those were the toughest, bravest guys. Man, I see those guys. You ever want, you want, you want to be humbled? Watch the first 20 minutes of Private Ryan, Saving Private Ryan. Unbelievable. Well, anyway, my uncle really um, led a wayward life after the war. But then he started coming back to God. Um, we've had some real tragedies in our family. His son, my cousin Dougie, was killed at 16 years old in an auto accident. And it just, it really affected him. Well, anyway, my Uncle Frank later on, as he started coming back to the faith, and um, he really became strong, especially through EWTN. He started learning about his faith. And, and he was on there, and he was watching. I was there in the house watching EWTN from Stockbridge, Massachusetts. All right, I'm in my early 20s. I'm not really sure about my faith yet. And I'm watching my Uncle Frank, and he's coming back to the faith, and he's watching this. And Father Kosicki, God bless him, he says on that broadcast, no sin is greater than the mercy of God. Now, what's funny is my uncle was struggling because he said he believes that he estimates pretty conservatively that he probably killed at least 50 Germans. He's pretty sure of that. He was pretty sure of that. He's now passed away. But he's pretty sure that he's killed close to 50 Germans in the war. And so it really started to bother him. It started to really struggle with this. And so he's watching Father Kosicki. And Father Kosicki says, yeah, the, no sin is greater than the mercy of God. And I'm sitting there next to my Uncle Frank. He's watching this. And he turns around to me and he says, boy, am I glad to hear that. <laughs> And I was like, that's it, Uncle Frank. And, you know, Uncle Frank came back with a vengeance to the church. And you know what's funny? My Uncle Frank told us, he said, because my dad said, you know, because um, I was getting ready to be ordained. And Uncle Frank was just, he was so excited. And he says, if they have to wheel me in on a stretcher, because he lived in, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> he lives in Michigan, lived in Michigan. He said, if they have to wheel me in in a stretcher, 
I am not missing Chris's ordination. He said, I will be there. I don't care if you have to put oxygen tanks on me and an iron lung. You are getting me into that ordination. He died two weeks before I was ordained. But I know <laughs> that he's up there. That he's up there because he's the living proof that no matter what we've done in our life, God can forgive us and will forgive us if we ask, right? This is the whole essence. So everybody, this is what God is promising. Go to confession. Receive Holy Communion. Become spotless. Get rid of the stain of sin. Get rid of the stain of punishment. This is why Father Seraphim said it's like a second baptism. Now, it isn't a second baptism, but it's like it. You know, okay, and I want to finish this, this part. Father Seraphim used to always say that, that actually Divine Mercy Sunday is greater than Easter. And I, I always say, I said this yesterday, I never went that far because it just didn't sound right. And the fact really is that it's all one day, right? It's an octave. So it's all one day. Easter to, to Divine Mercy Sunday is all one day. And so I never went as far as that to say that it was greater. But you know what? I think Father Seraphim's right. And I just discovered this. I've done all these talks on, on, on Divine Mercy, and I've never mentioned this because I never believed it. Now, Father Seraphim, you're still coaching me from upstairs because I think he was right. Now, listen to this. All right. First of all, we were redeemed on Easter Sunday. Everybody was redeemed. Now. Well, that, I guess I can just give you the answer to the first question. <laughs> Has all of mankind, every human who's ever lived, been redeemed? Yeah. Yes. Christ opened the door to heaven. You are redeemed. But will every human be saved? No. no. Some will choose. This is why he claimed Divine Mercy Sunday was greater. On Easter, we were redeemed. That's great. Nothing happens without it. But on Easter Sunday... I'm sorry, on Easter Sunday, you are redeemed, but on Divine Mercy Sunday, you are saved. What did he mean by that? Father Seraphim, and it took me finding a video of his just recently. I wish I could go back and redo all these Divine Mercy videos I've done. Because <laughs> why it's greater is because on Easter Sunday, Jesus opened the door to heaven. All right? On Easter Sunday, Jesus opened the door to heaven. This is powerful. But on Divine Mercy Sunday, you walk through that door. You walk through it. And, and, and this is what's so powerful. Now, Thomas Aquinas used to teach us, now you're going back to seminary with me. I only got eight minutes left to do this. You're going to get to seminary in eight minutes. <laughs> Thomas Aquinas said, there are two perfections in any person. One, that you exist. You all have that perfection. You exist. You were created by God. That is a form of perfection, the very fact that you exist. You know what he said? The second and greater perfection is when you become what you were created to be. You've all heard me use the example that what is the, and the, the Greeks call it a telos. When you realize that for which you're created. You ever say like, gee, I just, I want to know my calling. What is my vocation? Don't get caught up on this too deeply though. Some people, I had this one woman come to me and she was convinced that she was to be a nun. And she missed her calling. And she said, Father, I was to be a nun, absolutely to be a nun. I upset God. I'm, I'm not a nun. I, I'm going to do it now. I'm going to go leave and I'm going to become a nun. I, I go, what do you mean by leave? She's married with three children. <laughs> no! It is not God's will you be a nun. Now, maybe it was at the time, but God never shuts you out. You make your decision and then God will meet you where you're at. If you, if you were called to be a nun, but you miss it. God's not going to disown you, but now he's going to say, be the best wife and mother you can be, right? All right, so now, on Divine Mercy Sunday, we enter heaven. On Easter Sunday, he opened the door. On Divine Mercy Sunday, we enter through it. What does the Baltimore Catechism teach why we were created? To know God, love him, and serve him, and be happy with him forever in heaven, when you go through that door, you've realized the reason for which you were created. It's the second creation. It's the second perfection. It is what Thomas Aquinas and all of the church fathers said is a greater perfection than the first. So if Easter Sunday got opened the door to heaven, on Divine Mercy Sunday, you walk through that door, but you can't walk through it until you're spotless. And you can't be spotless until you get to confession and communion. You see how this ties? And so St. Augustine, listen to this. St. Augustine said, the eighth day is the compendium of the days of mercy, the greatest day. 
Listen to St. Thomas, the apostle, in the Apostolic Constitutions. After eight days, after the Feast of Easter, this is an apostle. After eight days, after the Feast of uh, of Easter, let there be another feast observed with honor. The eighth day itself on which he gave me Thomas. Why? When is the first Divine Mercy Sunday? You're going to hear the readings tomorrow. Jesus comes into the upper room. And guess who's there? Thomas. This is the eighth day because it says the first day of the next week after the resurrection. This is the Sunday, which was the first day after the resurrection. Thomas doesn't, and he doubts. And basically Thomas is saying, we need a feast on this day. So basically he says the eighth day itself on which he gave me, Thomas, who was hard of belief, full of assurance by showing me the print of his nails and the wound made in his side by the spear. So basically what Thomas is saying is we need this feast on the eighth day. Now, listen to the doctor of the church, St. Gregory of Nazianzen. He said, the octave day of Easter, meaning the eighth day, this is, this is a doctor of the church, is even a greater feast than Easter, though it takes nothing whatsoever away from the greatness of Easter, of the resurrection itself, because they are the same day. It is, he says, Easter Sunday is the boundary between death and life, a creation. But the eighth day, the octave, is the fulfillment of what Easter is all about. He said it fulfills Easter. Perfect life in eternity, a second creation, more admirable and more sublime than the first. Everybody the first perfection is to be created that you exist. The second perfection is to become what God created you to be. We are all created. We all have that first perfection. But when we enter into heaven, we've achieved the second perfection. We enter into heaven. That is why on Easter Sunday, he opened the door. But on Divine Mercy Sunday, we walk through it. But to walk through it, we got to be purified, cleansed, spotless. This is why he gives us Divine Mercy Sunday. I know I'm almost done. I got two minutes. All right. So, so yes, we can get a plenary indulgence, which is very similar. Wipe away all sins and punishment for a holy soul. But the Divine Mercy Sunday grace is only for yourself. Okay. All right, very important. All right, this is why the promise of Divine Mercy Sunday. And oh, oh, here's St. Thomas. I forgot that slide, sorry. Here's St. Thomas. What is he doing there? Poking the side. All right, St. Gregory and Enzienzen, January 3rd. So remember January 3rd. Remember July 3rd. January 3rd, July 3rd. They both said this. Now, Jesus says, on that day, the very depths of my tender mercy are open. I pour out a whole ocean of graces upon those souls who approach the fount of my mercy. Here it is, everybody, the extraordinary promise. The soul that will go to confession and receive holy communion shall obtain complete forgiveness of sins and punishment. This is the key. So when you go This is not mandatory. My brothers have been getting on me. I've never said this is mandatory. To get a grace that God offers, there's different kind of graces. God gives you some graces without you knowing or asking for it. Other graces, we have to ask for. This grace of Divine Mercy Sunday, you have to consciously do what Jesus says. So make this prayer, and it will help guarantee you the grace. I am not saying this is a requirement. I am saying this will help you to ask for the grace. What is this prayer? After receiving Holy Communion, This is what you got to remember. Come back to your pew and say a prayer, something like this. Lord Jesus Christ, son of the living God, you promised St. Faustina that the soul that has been to confession, I have. And the soul that receives holy communion with trust in divine mercy, I have, will receive the complete forgiveness of all sins and punishment. Lord, please give me this grace. Jesus, I trust in you. This is unbelievable. What God has given us. Forgiveness of sins. Now check this out, everybody. Uh, I'm going to go one more minute. For Do you know that forgiveness of sins is greater than the act of creation? 
Everybody thinks of the act of creation and how important it was. It is important. It was great. But do you know that the forgiveness of sins in the sacrament of confession is greater? Why? It is a greater act than creation because it, it's an act with an eternal effect. Creation does not have an eternal effect. It will all end. Creation is in time and will end. Forgiveness of sins is eternal. It will never end. Do you know confession is greater than an exorcism? Everybody who wants to say, oh, I got to get an exorcism, go to confession. Confession is a sacrament. Exorcism is just a sacramental. Confession is greater. What about this? We got a couple of quotes. This is what we have. Look at that. Divine mercy is not optional. This is why we come. Then Jesus, this is why these people are here. Why? Because Jesus says, I cannot punish even the greatest sinner if he makes an appeal to my compassion. On the contrary, I justify him in my unfathomable and unscrutable mercy. This is unbelievable. Diary 1146. What about this? This is why Jesus said, I have eternity for punishing, so I am prolonging the time of mercy for the sake of sinners. But woe to them if they do not recognize this time of my visitation. And finally, I am giving mankind the last hope of salvation. That is recourse to my mercy, and that includes the feast. This is amazing, everybody. And so, um, uh, this, I mean, first of all, remember, when you get this cleansing tomorrow, it doesn't cleanse everything in the future. Okay? Okay? It cleanses the past. Be grateful for that. All right? Now, do you have to go to confession on that day? You can go today. As long as you're in a state of grace. Faustina went the Saturday before uh, Divine Mercy Sunday. So, and, and now, is the grace only for yourself or can you give it to Holy Soul? Only for yourself. The plenary indulgence you can do on this day for a holy soul. All right? You can go to confession anytime before as long as you're in a state of grace. Can non-Catholics get this grace? Oh. <laughs> Teach a non-Catholic to do something very similar. They may not go to the sacrament of confession and communion, but here's what they can do. Make an act of contrition. Just telling God that you're sorry. And then make a spiritual communion uniting yourself with God. This is what you tell a non-Catholic. However, there's no greater way than the sacraments. The sacraments. All right, I finished two minutes late, but I'm going to finish with a 45-second video. Some of you have probably seen this, but I love it. This is a little 45-second summary of everything. It was to this novice, considered no one special by her superior, that Jesus Christ would quietly entrust a great mission. Christ instructed Faustina to remind the world about God's unfathomable mercy. She was to accomplish this by introducing new devotional practices to honor mercy and by establishing a worldwide movement of souls dedicated to spreading divine mercy. Jesus directed Faustina to proclaim to the world that even the worst and most hopeless sinner was deserving of God's infinite mercy. It is divine mercy, he said, that will determine the future destiny of the world. Speak to the world about my mercy. Let all mankind recognize my unfathomable mercy. It is a sign for the end times, after it will come the day of justice. While there is still time, let them have recourse to the fount of my mercy. Wow. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, everybody. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. God bless you. Thank you so much, everybody. God bless you for coming. We're thankful to everybody. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll finish.